to start by sort of reiterating what an exciting time it is. And I'm showing sort of the, the growth in compute power as a function of time, really mainly focused on a couple of, uh, of the key architectures, these uh, national supercomputing platforms. So I guess you said 2002 was the first BioIT conference. At that time, um, the, one of the most state-of-the-art computers was at Pittsburgh called the Mu. It had about 3,000 CPUs. And using the methods that I'm going to tell you about today, which are mainly physics-based molecular dynamic simulations, we were able to study biological systems on the order of um, sort of a single protein but embedded in a lipid bilayer, ATPase. It's one of the larger molecular machines that we know of in biology that had about uh, 500,000 atoms um, total in system size. And what you can see here is that about every four to five years, we've increased our computing power by an order of magnitude. And as we've done that, we've been able to, of course, uh, expand the complexity of the systems that we're studying with these approaches um, and also extend the time scales that we've been uh, able to approach. So uh, when the first supercomputers first came online, we were looking at um, uh, systems that were on the order of a single protein size and looking at biological time scales on the order of hundreds of picoseconds, which is, of course, quite short. And what I'll tell you about in the, in the closing part of my talk is how we're using now these leadership class computing facilities, which have over 300,000 cores and they have GPU acceleration also. And so they are enabling now us to study systems on the size of um, fully enveloped, uh, fully lipid enveloped viruses that have multiple hundreds of millions of atoms. And we can routinely access timescales on the order of uh, hundreds of microseconds. And so, of course, probably many of you have also heard about um, the plans for exascale computing, which are currently being, uh, you know, vigorously, uh, I guess, uh, imagined and uh, worked out, tried to uh, set that up. This is going to bring us into sustained exascale computing performance. I also want to mention, so it's the computing platforms, of course, which are driving a lot of uh, the, this uh, method development in these areas. It's also, however, commensurate advances in data science techniques, right? And, and as I'll touch on later, also the data itself. So it's really the convergence of high performance computing with data science and data that are, uh, that's really, I think, going to bring the transformative advances um, to many different fields. And so, um, right, so I'm a chemist. And so when, when most people think of chemists, uh, they think of people um, who you know, are wearing um, goggles and, and working at lab benches. And of course, I'm a chemist, but I'm a totally different kind of chemist. Um, so I would say computing is really transforming how we do chemistry. So you know, we used to think that it was really strictly a sort of a wet lab endeavor. But nowadays, when I think about our workflow, um, what we're doing is we can start with uh, data that's being uh, acquired at, for example, um, some of these terrific uh, uh, electron microscopes. And then we have um, this data is basically sent around on our campus at UC San Diego. We have something called the PRISM network, um, which is uh, 100 gigabit per second. Um, data transfer capabilities. So the data comes directly off the scope and goes to supercomputing platforms. Again, at San Diego, we're very fortunate to have one of the national supercomputing sites and um, a terrific machine called Comet that enables virtualization technologies specifically. But so uh, the data gets sent from the microscopes directly to for processing to the supercomputers where you could do, for example, segmentation and reconstruction. And then finally, we pull it down into our labs. Here's one of my students working on some of the model development. And then, of course, this data that we've acquired at the microscopes, we can connect to various types of community resources to continue to build out and augment the data sets that we ourselves have, which of with, of course, the broader ecosystem of data that's being generated um, at locations all over the world. And this data could take many, many forms. And then once we have this more comprehensive data set, we send it back out for um, perhaps uh, in order to look at the time-dependent dynamics of the system with these different physics-based approaches. And we do that, for example, on these petascale computing machines like Blue Waters, which is sitting over in Urbana-Champaign, the cornfields, for those of you who know it. Um, and then once the computing is done, we can bring it now back again to San Diego or La Jolla more uh, accurately. And we can start to interact with the data in various ways, including, including virtual reality. So this is really the new, um, this is the type of science that we do in my lab and that a lot of people nowadays are doing. We're really experiments, simulation, networking, and expertise sort of, again, converge together and come together as sort of a science super facility. 
And I also like to just point out that computing uh, is really transforming who does chemistry. Um, you know, this is a famous photograph from a very famous uh, physical chemistry conference uh, in the late 1920s. Marie Curie is in there. You can spot her. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say those, that's, those, of course, very esteemed physical chemists. Here are some new physical chemists. Um, these are a much younger group of folks, but who are really still doing, uh, I would say, transformative work and valuable work. Uh, the, the student here on the right, Eric Chen, um, he's now uh, running around somewhere in, in this area um, uh, at, at Harvard someplace. Anyway, he's now, um, when he was a 17-year-old high school student, he actually used some of the approaches I'll tell you about today in order to uh, come up with, actually discover some new um, uh, small molecules that were active against a target in influenza called endonuclease. And um, in addition to being able, as a 16 or 17-year-old, to uh, have a, a first author publication, actually, um, he also went on to, you know, win the Google Science Fair and all sorts of things. But it's really, I will say, um, these technologies are becoming more and more accessible, more and uh, more easy for people to to operate even on their own laptops and to actually uh, make scientific discoveries. So um, again, again, computing is changing that landscape as well. But um, you know, I think, of course, I'm not alone in thinking this, um, that research breakthroughs of the future are going to really occur at the intersection of observational and simulation science. And the, the data, together with you know, powerful new algorithms and methods, uh, is going to really be, I think, the driver for solving some of our most pressing challenges, um, not only in health, but in areas like climate change, where we're looking at environmental and atmospheric chemistry and trying to understand how bacteria in the ocean actually are causing it to rain or causing it not to rain, um, in the area of sustainable energy for the design uh, and modification of various uh, energy and materials research platforms. And as I'll tell you about today in biology and medicine and specifically how we're going to be, um, how we're trying to look towards the future in uh, developing state-of-the-art, very exciting, I think, models of uh, ultimately whole cells in order to develop new therapeutics. So the biology is, and medicine is what I'll focus on today. So most of the methods that I'm going to tell you about actually involve um, molecular dynamic simulations. And I like to think of this, uh, taking, taking a cue from my uh, former advisor or mentor, as um, I like to think of these simulations actually as a computational microscope. And so um, you can see here sort of a protein. What I'm indicating here is a protein under the lens of a microscope. And you can see its atoms wiggling and jiggling. And so this is the time-dependent trajectory of the atomic motion of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the atoms in this particular protein. And we can look, we can predict this atomic level motion, again, the time-dependent dynamics of these systems, using a, what, what is basically a fairly simple equation. It's the only equation I'll show today, but just uh, so that people sort of remember or um, can see sort of what's under the, under the hood, um, where basically we're approximating all of the atoms in our systems, our protein systems mainly, or our nucleic acids, et cetera, our lipids, we're basically approximating all the atoms in our systems like hard spheres. And then we, um, we have different terms that basically describe the interaction of variable atom types in our system. So every two atoms that are connected form a, a bond, and they have a particular, they're represented with a particular term here. Every three atoms that are connected form an angle. We have dihedrals. This forms our, our bonded interactions. And then we have our so-called non-bonded interactions, like our simple electrostatic potential here and, um, and uh, the van der Waals or Leonard Jones potential for, uh, for overlap or steric collision. And then essentially all we're doing is integrating Newton's equation of motion over time. And so when we do this, we integrate one step. And we, so we start with a particular structure. Typically, this is a high resolution crystal structure from x-ray crystallography. We integrate one time step. We get a new structure. We integrate another time step. We get another structure. We do this millions and billions and trillions of times. And we basically build up a dynamical understanding of, again, the time dependent dynamics of our system and its interaction with various partners if the model, depending on the complexity of the model. And so this really, I mean, what I always found exciting about this was that it, 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 it combines chemistry with physics and math and computing uh, in order to, uh, in most cases, and I'm interested in, learn something exciting about biology. <laughs> 
Right, so um, I don't have too much time today, and I of course I want to tell you more than I can. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about P53, which um, I want to tell you because I think it's sort of it's suggestive of the power of these computational methods for drug discovery in particular. It also links towards precision medicine. Um, and then I'm going to, um, and then I'll sort of expand into sort of more of a future looking view of where we're going. So P53, many of you probably have heard of, this is a so-called guardian of the genome. Uh, it basically um, is, uh, it's uh, a tumor suppressor protein that essentially uh, senses d uh, cell damage, so this could be in the form of, for example, DNA breaks, UV radiation or stress. It senses this damage and then upregulates, is a transcription factor for a number of different pathways that regulate essentially programmed cell death, right, or cell suicide. So it does that through gross arrest, uh, apoptosis, prevention of angiogenesis, et cetera. Um, and so what we found in, or what they have found in over 50% of human cancers is that the P53 gene is mutated. And you can see here, um, I'm showing the P53 gene, and I'm focusing in on this red domain here. This is the so-called core domain for DNA binding, or the DNA binding domain. I'm representing, I'm representing what the, the expressed folded protein looks like for that core domain down here in the green ribbon. But going back up here, what you can see is that the frequency of p53 mutations of can in cancer are shown here um, as a, essentially a histogram for the total uh, number of mutations that are sensed in cancer at this site. And you can see that there's basically about, I mean, there's a number of mutations, but there's really about six that sort of dominate uh, from clinical data. And um, so it turns out there's over about 600,000 new cancer patients that are diagnosed with, P50, with cancers that have P53 mutations uh, annually. Okay, and so, um, so I'm really interested again in sort of the structure and trying to understand the structure of various biomolecules, um, very often proteins, and how they're, in this case, how mutations can alter the activity. And so what I'm showing here with the red spheres these are basically these locations of these various uh, cancer mutants in the core domain. And so what happens is that P53 will adopt just one of these point mutations, um, and then um, it basically becomes essentially destabilized. And in becoming destabilized, it's no longer, it becomes then inactive. So we have the wild type 53, which will sense DNA, or sense cell damage and upregulate those pathways uh, for cell, essentially for cell death. Cancer mutants um, then become inactive, so the cell is damaged, but these pathways essentially never get activated, so these cells essentially just uh, continue to live on. But one of the interesting things about P53 that they, that they discovered is that they ha it also has something called rescue mutants. So P53 is able to adopt a secondary point mutation, and these are shown here in blue, so it could be at any of these spots, where um, the secondary point mutation actually essentially restabilizes the protein fold and causes, it, it basically reactivates P53. Okay, and so um, a longstanding dream of cancer biologists has been to um, basically try to develop small molecules that will reactivate P53, much in the way that uh, the secondary uh, point mutations were able to also rescue its activity. And so again, conceptually here, the idea is that you have an active P53 um, that has a cancer mutant, and you would develop some sort of small molecule drug that would bind to this inactive P53 and essentially reactivate it, causing the cells to die and the tumors to regress. And um, so there's been a number, I mean, there's been many, many studies of P53 in the literature. These two that I show here basically show how restoration of P53 function led to tumor suppression uh, in vivo. There were a few studies there um, in, I guess, about 2007. Um, so it's been a target that has been uh, under investigation for quite some time. And um, if you look, however, at the literature in terms of how many molecules are known to reactivate, there's really only a handful of molecules. Um, one paper in 2009 published by Bykoff and Farish and co-workers um, actually showed, was able to find a compound that reactivated mutant P53 by covalently binding to the core domain. Um, but they couldn't, and they knew that they could, so these were some of the products actually that they, uh, are some of the, the molecules that they disclosed in that paper and another one from a different study. They basically identified covalent attachment of these molecules to P53, but because of experimental limitations, they couldn't figure out which of the 10 cysteine residues was actually the one required for the in vivo activity. 
And so we started to take a look at P53 because we knew it was highly dynamic, and we knew that our methods lend themselves very well to uh, investigating the dynamics of proteins. And so this is sort of the wiggling and jiggling that you see here. These are, this is the type of information that we typically get out of these biophysical simulations. So when X-ray crystallographers are, resolve an image, um, you know, we are constantly driving typically towards higher and higher resolution uh, data. This is good because then we know better the exact position of, relative position of the atoms. But what often happens is that as we drive towards higher and higher resolution, we are forced to freeze out the dynamics of the system. And they do this by perhaps clipping off loops, by introducing mutations that stabilize the protein, et cetera. So these computational approaches can be used as a complementary way of, a, uh, we can reintroduce all of the different, the wild type pieces of the structure that were mutated out for the high resolution uh, uh, data acquisition. And then furthermore, we can basically try to predict how this molecule actually moves in solution. And so it, in the case, this is what that P53 core domain looks like. This is sort of the wiggling and jiggling that you see. And I'm calling, so I have some of the protein represented in sort of the purple ribbon, and one, of the, um, one part of the protein represented as surface. And what I show here in the middle, this is one particular cysteine, cysteine-124, that you can see sort of has a pocket around it that's quite mobile, and sometimes it sticks out, and sometimes it sticks back, so it's moving around. So, um, you know, we were sort of looking at all the cysteines, but this cysteine in particular was very interesting because it turns out there's over 100 structures now of the P of P53 core domain in the protein database. And every single one of those structures has that cysteine basically tucked back in a position that's occluded from solvent. So if you were just looking at this structure, you wouldn't necessarily think that it could become available for covalent binding. But what we, set, what we saw happen in the molecular dynamics simulations, as I just showed you, was very rapidly this pocket essentially relaxed into an open conformation that um, would be able to um, fit something in there. And so not only did these simulations reveal a new site, but um, through different docking and computation, what we call computational solvent mapping algorithms, we predicted that not only did this site open from the dynamics, but also this site had a high propensity to, to bind ligand functional groups, which essentially meant that it could be druggable. So we were very excited about that. And you can see here us trying to fit a molecule inside that binding site and sort of the different contacts it makes. Right, so then we, um, we we performed what we call virtual screening. So uh, another sort of complementary approach to uh, wet lab drug discovery is to, uh, to basically computationally dock libraries of molecules into um, the different snapshots of our, what we call our receptor or our drug target structure. So not only did we try docking into the crystal structure, but we also docked into uh, some of the structures extracted from the molecular dynamic simulations that had, for example, the more open pocket. And when we did this, and we recommended then a set of compounds to our experimental collaborators for testing, we found, um, we actually recommended only two dozen compounds, which is quite a small set. Um, and we found one molecule here, stictic acid, that actually showed dose-dependent rescue in mammalian cancer cells. This was against the R175H mutant. And not only that, but um, in the same paper, we also showed, um, that cysteine-124, that cysteine that we saw sort of moving around, that it actually was the point of attachment for a molecule, one of the molecules that had been discovered in 2009. And why that turned out to be interesting was because actually this compound um, is now in clinical trials. So it helped to describe um, or enumerate, actually irrationalize um, the mechanism of action of, uh, of, the, trial, of the compound, um, which, uh, which we were quite excited about. And then, of course, with this early success that we published, um, we uh, significantly expanded the approach to see if we could actually develop some of our own compounds that would reactivate P53. And we sort of launched a campaign that would, um, instead of docking a few thousands of compounds, we're actually now docking, we've docked millions of compounds. And we've done that, as I showed you, um, not just against the 175H mutant, but we have it now against panels of mutants so that we can specifically target um, different mutant forms because as it turns out, each of these mutant forms is highly dynamic. So in these cancer mutations, the over, 
uh, the overarching theme is that it destabilizes that core domain, which means that there's more flexibility. But the different pockets that open and the different opportunities for restabilization by small molecules actually seems to differ with the particular mutation. And that makes sense because it's, these mutations um, you know, will destabilize it, but, but uh, um, have local effects that will control, for example, formation of different pockets and so forth. So we now have many multiple dozens of compounds um, and, uh, that, that reactivate and are specific for particular uh, for particular p53 mutant forms. And actually, this has gone on. Um, so I, I think I'm required to tell you that I'm co-founder, I have equity interest in, and I'm on the scientific advisory board of Actavalon, which is um, a startup company out. And we just moved into uh, the J Labs uh, out in San Diego. So that, that's actually going well. So that's the first story, just to sort of uh, emphasize why we care about modeling the flexibility and how it can connect to genomic data for particular cancers or for really any, for many diseases. Um, but one in three, so I put this up here because one in three is actually the, the chances that if you're living in the United States that you'll be diagnosed with cancer in your lifetime, which is an extraordinarily high number. So we actually partnered with NVIDIA um, and were given an award from their Compute the Cure Foundation, so they have a foundation. Um, uh, to, um, to try to uh, fund some of what they think are the, uh, an exciting um, new opportunities in, in drug discovery. And we basically worked with them to develop a pipeline for our end-to-end -end workflow. And the reason that we did this is because, um, you know, the story with P53 is great, but of course it's going to take more than just my lab uh, working on one target in order to try to really make uh, inroads into cancer. We need to be able to develop technologies that are, in, you know, I'm an academic, so I think most of the case freely accessible helps so that people, researchers all over the world can, can take them and use these technologies and do their own studies and hopefully uh, come up with uh, the next molecule to target the next new uh, drug receptor um, that's needed in cancer. On top of that, as I'm sure many of you know in here, so these workflows, um, so we actually uh, partnered with uh, the Kepler workflow framework developers. These workflows allow us to increase reuse. Uh, they allow for really great scaling to a number of different heterogeneous computing resources. This was sponsored in particular by NVIDIA because it turns out that the, uh, the same technology, so these graphical processing units, um, are very highly amenable to the types of mathematical computations that we're doing, right? So uh, the same architectures that they invest billions of dollars to actually render video game graphics to be highly realistic actually turns out to be useful for science as well. And so we've recently published uh, this workflow and made it available uh, for folks to use. Okay. So, but where are we really headed? So that's, that's sort of the story of, of a, the recent story of the past. But where we're headed is really um, in trying to, so chemistry, drug discovery, biology, all these things, these are really inherently multi-scale. How does a mutation in the active site of a protein or of an enzyme, how does that really, how does the behavior actually play out, not just in the, in the protein itself, but how does it play out in the, in the subcellular environment, so the local neighborhood that it's sitting in? How does it actually then, um, what's the emergent behavior in cells, and how do cells basically all cooperate um, in their sort of ecosystem-like community of tissues? So, you know, trying to actually understand this um, is, is quite difficult for a number of different reasons. So, of course, we're experimentally limited in many cases in terms of um, how we can actually visualize, for example, structure at these different scales. Um, but we can also use computing to try to fill those gaps. And so, um, so we, what I told you mostly about in the first part of my talk was um, sort of these biophysical approaches that address molecular and macromolecular phenomena, so small molecule binding to particular targets. Um, in terms of the spatial and temporal scales, we're talking about angstrom to nanometer type. Uh, in terms uh, of spatial scales and temporal scales going from femtoseconds to microseconds. Um, where I want to tell you about, so the challenge areas that we're trying to make inroads into is um, in stretching molecular modeling into what we, what we call the mesoscale. So bringing atomic resolution to micron type systems, micron scale systems, and to sample their dynamics 
um, with all the detail, not just at the smaller time scales, but how can we get out to routinely to microseconds and even milliseconds. And so, um, again, as I touched on, it's not just the computing, it's not just data science, but it's also the data that we're so excited about, uh, data from genomics and so forth, but also, in our case, structural data. And so um, this is structural data in terms of X-ray crystallography. Of course, everybody has heard about the, the resolution revolution in cryo-electron microscopy owing it to great advances in the, detector tech, the, the direct detector technologies. Those advances also impact other areas of imaging like electron tomography, which where I'm showing here, um, where you can basically take these different serial sections of cells and really reconstruct much larger, not just macromolecular complexes, but much larger componentry of basically subcellular level uh, ultrastructure, essentially, in the cell, and also serial block electron microscopy, where basically you put an ultra microtome inside, uh, inside the, the EM, and so basically you have your tissue embedded in a plastic sample, and you, have, you, you image one layer, and then you have a diamond knife that basically shaves off one very thin layer, then you image again, shaves it off, image again. This guy runs uh, it just works its way through these, um, through these samples, and actually in these structures you will have, um, uh, you have really uh, getting down to, I think what they're hoping to ultimately get down to is tens of nanometer isotropic resolution for um, uh, basically uh, cubic millimeter sized chunks of tissue. So we want to connect to these exciting data sources using um, uh, these biophysical simulation approaches. For P53, what that means is that instead of studying that single domain protein, how do we actually, you know, tr this, we instead are trying to now sort of build the more realistic view of what this protein actually looks like in vivo. So um, there's actually four, so this purple domain is the same purple domain I showed you before, but actually it's a tetramer that sort of grips onto the DNA, and it has many other segments um, that basically serve as accessory proteins that are helping to basically bind to the DNA to sort of search for what we call the recognition sequence that it will ultimately bind to and activate. Um, uh, and, and it has other accessory proteins as well that it's sort of pulling in. So we developed um, what we call, we use integrative modeling where we can link to, um, we can basically combine multiple different high resolution structures and lower resolution cryo-electron microscopy to actually uh, get a sense for what these larger scale simulations uh, systems look like but still maintain the atomic detail. And so now we're talking about building systems that instead of having maybe 50,000 atoms, they have almost 2 million atoms. And again, we're able to sample out to microsecond time scale to understand how, for example, in this case, DN what, what, we, what we saw happening was that um, when P53 approached a response element, it actually sort of clamps down differently on the DNA than when it's just, um, just uh, uh, sort of just a, a random sequence. Okay, but so um, what we really want to do and where we're going, where we're already headed, is in trying to develop uh, really sort of 3D, highly detailed 3D models essentially of cells, which is sort of the, the, the grand view. But um, so what we're doing is developing tools that are allowing us to extend molecular structure to cellular environments. And so CellPack is one tool that's developed at uh, the resource I direct, the National Biomedical Computation Resource. And here's where I think we can really connect in terms of data. So, um, so what I'm representing here is, uh, so this would be sort of our working unit in CellPack. And what we're doing is we can define, um, for example, different compartments in our biological unit. So uh, for example, our cell. We can actually take the, um, the compartments directly from different types of imaging sources, and then we can, we can basically create different recipes for each of these different compartments. So the interior ingredients, we can specify here, this could be a number of different actual protein structures, or it could be anything. We can get this data, so the data that get, gets ingested into cell pack are things like protein structure um, and cryo-electron microscopy structure. We can take um, uh, tomograms, fluorescent microscopy, we can connect to proteomics, uh, just literature data, et cetera. And we can basically use these as constraints inside uh, to parameterize um, these different um, recipes that then can pack uh, 
uh, these different compartments in different ways using these substituents at, at the particular locations. And so um, not only can we then build, so it used to be really, really hard to even build one model of a system with so much complexity um, might take one or two years. We now, because uh, be, with cell pack, um, once we define these basically different recipes, it can then basically pretty rapidly stochastically create um, multiple different uh, models uh, in parallel. And so we can actually, instead of just creating one single complex model, we're actually able to uh, create ensembles of models, which is important because it will allow us to uh, hopefully address heterogeneity in biological systems, uh, which is obviously a huge challenge. So one example of where we've done that actually uh, involves the flu, so influenza virus. So for many years, uh, people were uh, at the structural level just studying the single glycoproteins on the surface of flu. So these are act this is actually a collaboration with Alistair Steven at the, at the NIH. These are uh, cryo-electron uh, uh, tomography data of different flu particles. And what we can do, we, what we've done is basically create a fully atomic reconstruction of the outer envelope of flu. This used cell pack and other tools that we had to create in order to, for example. So flu um, isn't a capsided, it's, it's not a virus with a capsid. It actually has, um, it has a lipid envelope, so it's a fully enveloped virus. Um, so we had to develop tools that allow us to build this membrane at atomic detail and it, um, that according to, for example, in this instance, one of the shapes actually that they saw uh, in the tomograms that was representative of, uh, of sort of a standard flu particle. So what this allows us to do, because we're carrying around all the molecular, the atomic level detail, this allows us to now really start to understand drug action at scale because we can actually, um, so this is sort of walking through the reconstruction of the flu. But we can now, so um, we actually built this system um, and we solvated it with explicit solvent, which I'm not showing. So there's water molecules there as well, which I've stripped away so you can see. And so what this is showing is the dynamics of our 160 million atom system. We ran that on blue waters. It's the largest biophysical simulation that we know of. Um, it was completed in, in late 2015. And so you can see the wiggling and jiggling that you see there. So I'm sort of moving this at the same time, sort of trans rotating this guy. But the wiggling and jiggling, those are, that is the time dependent uh, dynamics of the influenza virus. And so, you know, a lot of people actually, I have to say, were, were really highly critical at first saying, you know, well, what are you going to learn? You're going to build this huge system. It's going to take you two years to build it. It's going to take you two years to simulate it. You're going to, then you're going to have all this data. And you could have just learned exactly what you were going to learn from many small, trajectories of just the single proteins. And, you know, I, uh, we did it anyway. Um, and I would say that actually, no, that's not true. You don't just learn what you have the same, you're not just getting the same information that you get when you're just studying a single system in isolation. And I think that what we're learning now is that when you can actually bring in the complexity more in the real form that, um, you learn about the correlated dynamics of different molecules in the system and how they can affect each other. And actually, I would say it opens up entirely new questions and biological hypotheses that you couldn't have even have imagined uh, in the first, just thinking about uh, continuing to study things in the single system. Um, but one of the interesting things, so it, we did actually, so what I'm showing here, this is again a picture of the flu virus. I'm showing what it looked like at the beginning of our dynamics trajectory in sort of the solid color and what it looked like at the end sort of overlapped in this glowing wireframe. And basically you see, actually it does look the same. It doesn't look like there was any sort of huge rearrangement, which is maybe what we would expect because we actually were only able to run for about 160 nanoseconds. But what we can do is actually be more intelligent about how, about how we're statistically analyzing the, the dynamics trajectories that are coming out. And because we have so many different copies, when we build these big systems with many different copies of the same protein, which will be the case essentially for any complex biological system that you build, you end up with all these different copies that are basically sampling independent trajectories. And so you can use Markov state model theory to basically bring those trajectories together into one cohesive framework and actually extract out long time scale dynamics for many short time scale simulations. And so we have been able to, for the first time, actually address 
questions um, about loop dynamics and active site dynamics. This is a, this is a picture of the active site of, of, of influenza neuraminidase, which is um, the target for most of the drug, of the flu drugs that we take. Um, and we discovered new novel po druggable pockets and so forth. And we can do the same kind of analysis essentially for every type of component in the system. So we also did a similar Markov state model analysis for the hemagglutinin um, glycoprotein, which is a cool protein. People care about it because this is where your vaccine antibodies bind. Um, and we found two, uh, a lot of different, we were able to extract out a lot of interesting information for folks in the flu about um, where these antibodies are binding and sort of their underlying dynamics. And so, um, so I'm closing because we want to have a few minutes for questions. Um, but I, I, I hope that sort of what I told you about today was really our efforts to really take molecular modeling to the mesoscale, which will be possible owing to the tremendous advances in the computing architectures as well as advances in data science. Five years ago when we started the center, when, I, when the center was renewed, we were studying all of, most all of our targets at the atomic level were on the order of about 10 nanometers in size. We've now moved up to 100 nanometers in size. This is the influenza viral particle. And we're getting to the size of uh, micron now. So this is actually um, a molecular model of uh, the actin gel inside a dendritic spine. Um, and so I, you know, we're tremendously excited about uh, about these advances and um, about linking to all the different complex data sources that we'll need to in order to accurately build these models and make them maximally predictive. All right, and so with that, I'll close it up. This is just my acknowledgement slide. I have a terrific group, terrific mentors. I've been fairly well funded, thankfully. We'll see what happens with uh, the next budget. Um, and I thank all of you guys for your attention. Happy to take questions.